Once again, welcome everyone to today's Cosmex webinar series presentation, Building Your Automated Law Office. Presenting today, we have Erica Burstner, the Director of Strategic Communication at Cosmex. Erica has several years of experience in the legal industry, catering to the specialized technology needs of small to mid-sized law firms. She has given numerous presentations across the country on legal technologies, such as law practice technology management, cloud computing, and legal billing and trust accounting compliance. And with that, I will go ahead and pass the presentation over to Erica. Great, thank you so much. So to start on today's topic, uh, these are the three areas we'll be focusing on. First, taking a little bit of time just to understand the overall general needs of most law firms and kind of see where you may uh, fit in that equation. Defining automation, uh, understanding what it is and in what situations it's a benefit and one in what situations maybe it's not necessary. And then automating the five major areas of your firm. So we'll talk about uh, a few examples of struggles that many law firms face and how automation can really take your uh, firm to the next level. So in terms of law firm needs, um, every firm's a little bit different, uh, you know, different practice areas, different sizes, different focus, different resources, but in general, these needs do apply throughout. Now your priority of those needs may be different uh, for one firm versus another, but it's important to be aware of these different components, how they work together, and kind of identifying uh, where it is that it's most important to your practice. So first is legal time and billing, of course, your time and expense tracking, your invoicing, your collections, payments as well. But that then leads into accounting, specifically business accounting. Um, how are you tracking your, your income, your expenses, your general accounting reports? Also those costs associated to clients as well. Then trust accounting, that is specific to law firms. It's governed by a lot of compliance and a lot of regulations. You need to make sure that you're following the rules, especially in that area. But it is something that is both accounting related and legal specific. So it's important that you're uh, aware of what is required, both on a federal level and a state level in regards to managing those funds, reconciliation, reporting, uh, and all of that. And the last two really relate to daily activities. You have events on your calendar, tasks that have to be completed, documents you may be drafting, communication with your client as well. Those occur day in and day out. Uh, the volume may differ depending on your firm, but in general, they can be quite scattered. It can be overwhelming, can be hard to track, but it's important that they are part of your full picture. Now, the two main points here is all of these do feed into each other. They all relate to each other at one point. You have to bill for certain items. You need to use funds to pay invoices. You need to um, manage your accounting reports, which of course income is related to billing as well. So they do cross over quite a bit and they all have something to do with the case that you're working on. That's what that matter centric means. So if you are, um, you know, doing all these different types of activities, what case is it related to? And does your current setup allow you to really focus on um, not just everything as a whole, which is important, but each individual case and get a full uh, 360 view of that? So we'll be focusing on uh, each area and how automation can really help to take your game to the next level. As a visual, I will be using Cosmlex to demonstrate some of the concepts of automation. And for those who may not know, Cosmlex is an all-in-one cloud-based legal practice management system. And it will help to just kind of provide a visual aid to the points that we're discussing. So first off, I mentioned we're gonna define automation. Automation is by definition, the technique, method, or system of operating or controlling a process by highly automated means, usually by electronic devices, basically removing human interaction or making that to a minimum. Now there are some situations where automation is great, you know, in order to utilize things like software and tools to take a process that might take hours or days and reduce it down to minutes. But there are other areas like, you know, consulting directly with your client or defending your client in a court case or drafting contracts for your client. Those specialties, that is what you're meant to be focusing on. Those are not so much automated necessarily. That's where your skill set is. But more of the 
admin side of things, the items that can be, you know, many things applied across the board. That's where automation can really uh, improve your practice. So let's talk about our first area, which is billing. So some of the struggles that law firms have, uh, you may have the issue of having individual delayed entries and not just time, but also expenses as well. When you're handling especially hourly billing, it really can seem like a hassle to track all of your time, catch all of your expenses, because you're in the middle of your daily work, you're trying to be productive and you have to stop and track the, the individual items that you have to build your client. But that's the point, it's important for billing. Um, that's how you get paid. So while it can be a bit of an inconvenience, it can be hard to track, it is essential to your business to make sure that you're earning uh, money for those functions. I actually know a lot of law firms that have switched to a flat fee because they don't wanna be bothered tracking hourly. But that comes with its own consequences as well. You need to make sure that that's um, an accurate billing amount, uh, that you're being a lot more efficient with your time. So it doesn't work for every situation. But if you are uh, doing the hourly billing, you need to be aware that very often these time entries can be delayed. For the invoicing, this is very often drawn out. Um, at the end of the month, it could very uh, often be kind of a, a long process of a couple of weeks uh, where you might be looking on uh, the past month, all the different timekeepers are looking at the time that they entered, what they may have forgotten, reviewing their expenses, maybe squeezing in some items that they are kind of remembering after the fact and making sure those are there or making adjustments to uh, either the invoice or pre-bills that they may have. And then that whole process is done, which depending on how that workflow is set up can be quite time consuming. Then the invoicing part comes where it says, you know, we need to get all these invoices out. Often they're drafted individually, maybe taking up days of the staff's time. And then the clients are not getting it at that point. Let's say you start your billing process on, uh, let's say I'll do for March, March 1st. And it doesn't get to the clients till maybe the 15th of the month. That is quite common and that's a long time. That's a two week delay. So your clients are actually receiving those bills a lot later and that can of course affect your collections effort. And then when it comes to delivery, so the invoices are reviewed, they're ready to go. A lot of firms are printing out these invoices and stuffing them into uh, envelopes. That could take many hours. I do understand that that's a comfort level for many firms, uh, depending on your client base. Sometimes it helps your collections to do it that way but there's a lot of new delivery options which can be much more efficient and secure and they can be used in addition to mailing if that's something that works very well for your firm. So let's talk about automation. Uh, with billing, there's a lot of ways that you can really cut down the time being spent and be able to get those bills out to your clients that much sooner. So first is mobility, being able to record in the moment with um, applications like cloud applications, this is more and more a possibility. You no longer have to wait till you get back to the office or jot down a note or send an email. You can actually make these entries on the go. There are mobile apps. Uh, you can access anywhere, anytime on a tablet. I mean, we have all different types of devices now. It used to be you have a computer and that's it. Now you might have three or four devices that you'll be able to access your information wherever you are and get that time and expense, don't forget those, get those recorded as soon as possible so that way uh, they will get billed at the end of the month. Timers and timesheets. Now timers, uh, it does depend on the type of work that you do if it's realistic to use timers, but they are great for improving the accuracy of your entries. You also can do this in the office and on the go. A lot of these mobile apps for these billing tools have timers built in as well. So it's not just when you're in the office. If you're a big multitasker, but you like to use timers, look for tools that allow managing multiple timers. You know, I can jump back and forth, but of course the key is you should not be able to run more than one at a time. That usually factors into whether it's a legal specific billing tool or not. But if you have timers and you use them, definitely the ability to jump between different clients is essential because you're rarely focusing on one thing 100% of the time. 
Now with timesheets, uh, when I talk about that, I'm not talking about physical paper timesheets, which are still very common in law firms, but I'm talking about digitizing everything. You want to be able to uh, actually have similar to a physical timesheet that you know you used to on a piece of paper, just filling in all of your time, but having it in a way that completely reduces that double data entry. A lot of the uh, billing softwares have, it's usually called a timesheet function or a time log, where you can have 20, 30 entries on one page. But the key is you're entering it in the software itself. So you're not having to write it out on, you know, the attorney write it out on a piece of paper, and then a secretary or, or an admin then entering it to the billing software, whatever tool that they're using. Utilizing the software itself for this, again, whether it's in the office or on the go, will make sure that that time gets captured and that it is saving the extra steps that normally take place. Then we get into bill generation and delivery. There are a lot of batch functions in software. Um, things that, billing is really full of high volume activity, and that's where uh, a lot of the automation of software could be, make it super simple, and it's very common across many applications. So the first thing is, uh, as I mentioned before, every firm's a little bit different as to how you have your bill workflow. You know, often you have a pre-bill and you review and you finalize, and then you go to invoicing. Um, the volume can depend on whether you're doing all hourly or if you do a mix of maybe flat and contingency, that could affect the amount of invoices you have. But in general, um, so for an example with, let's say this batch billing, I have 100 invoices. I can generate them all at once, have the parties review within the program, and then finalize it in a group. So as opposed to looking at generating each individual invoice separately, exporting it, having somebody review it, importing it, having somebody make changes, and then uh, generating a finalized bill, which is an additional step very often as well. That whole workflow can be highly, highly simplified. And you can go from you know, preparing your invoices and reviewing them from days to hours. So instead of going to you know, the 15th of the month, your client getting that bill, maybe they're gonna get it the fifth of the month which is actually makes a really big difference in your collections and also your client's uh, satisfaction as well. In regards to delivery, sometimes it depends on your client base as to how you want to deliver your invoices, but if at all possible, it really is best to focus on electronic delivery or at least have that part of your delivery process because it really can cut down the time that you're spending on this billing drastically. If you're Emailing, because you might be emailing right now, but you might be sending individual emails. That's not really automated. It's a better delivery method, but you're still doing each individual one at a time. So with um, many billing tools, you can have these mail merging type of functions where there could be one message, kind of a template for the, um, the email that you're sending. It will merge information for that person and then send out I'll use the example of that 100, 100 invoices all at once. So not only is it a quick delivery that your client's gonna get right away, but it took you two minutes as opposed to maybe several hours. There are also functions like uh, client portals. Uh, for those who might not be familiar, a lot of the web-based practice management tools have this type of function where you can have a website that you invite your client to and you can share information with them. It can be uh, events or tasks or invoices, like here, documents, all those types of matter-related uh, items. And with invoices, it kind of gives an immediate delivery, which is, is very nice. So let's give a little bit of a visual of these types of functions. So we'll start with timers and, and timesheets. Let me pull that up. So I am in the Cosmox program and I'm just on the matter page. So this is my list of files right here, the different cases that I'm working on. And for time, like I mentioned, you could do an individual time card, that's no problem. But we have this timesheet function where you can either utilize it as a multi-timer, you know, jump between different timers, or I can type in the time that I'm spending and go right down the sheet. And I can have as many here as I want, scroll through them and post them when I'm ready. Especially if you're in a multi-attorney firm, 
very often each attorney has their own preference for using tools. You know, some may love timers, some may love time sheets, some like to do individual cards. So having those options, whatever fits each attorney best is also um, a good thing to have as well. Now for billing, uh, like I said, any sort of batch actions, wherever you can do things in a batch, that's best. And that's where the software really comes in to help with automation. So if I go to my invoicing area here, I can see that I have all these invoices already generated, but let's say I'm about to generate for this month. I can click create and the system's gonna tell me who has an unbilled balance. I happen to have 14 matters. So again, the, the system is doing the work for me. These are the people that need to be billed. These are their balances over here. I can filter if I need to. Maybe I'm just generating for one attorney right now. I can do that. Um, I can um, filter by client or by a certain custom field. But the key is once you get the list that you want, usually it's more than one, you're able to generate them all at once. Click generate. I have 14 new bills that are there. Review process. Now, every system's a little bit different as to, you know, is it a separate pre-bill? Is it uh, a bill that can be edited? In our system, you can edit a uh, bill that might not be final. So if I, actually, let me generate one of these invoices so I have an example for you all. Okay, so I generated this invoice and you see that the lock is open. So that means it's not yet final, so I can make changes. The most efficient way is to just come in the system, the actual timekeeper, edit the invoice, edit the time card, make my changes, go ahead and generate, and it will update that invoice. So it's a lot more efficient than printing, marking up, and getting it back to the billing person. But then the billing person can say, this is now locked for edits, and they can do this for multiple invoices. They have the ability to finalize. I happen to only have one that's not final right now, but even if you have 50, you can select them all, finalize them, and lock them for edits going forward. So just because people have access to the system does not mean everybody can make edits, everybody can make changes, but you can lock and unlock in a, in a very efficient manner. We talked about emailing. Um, this is, like I said, both an efficient delivery method, but, but the, more of the mail merge function is where the power really comes in. So if I go to email invoices, I can select multiple people. So I have a list, I could select a whole list, few people. So I selected six. And the key is this template. So to be able to take this information for each person, merge the information together, and then send this out, I can get all of those 100 invoices out in one click. And that of course is a big time saver, but each client is still getting their own email, their own message, and their own invoice attached. All right, let's move on to our next point, which is collections. Now collections is, is tied with billing, but I do like to keep it as a separate topic because it is an area where a lot of law firms struggle uh, for these main reasons here. First off, there's no prevention in place. There's a lot that you can actually do prior to sending a bill to your client that can really help with collections, like being timely with your billing, detailed descriptions, um, clearly communicating expectations to your client at the very start. Those are all things that can be done way ahead of time at the start of the client relationship as well, uh, making sure that all of that is very clear. But once it comes to the point where collections do need to take place, and very often they do, even if you have those preventative methods in place, there's still gonna be some people who don't pay their bills. That's just the nature of uh, specifically the legal industry, especially any service industry, this tends to happen. Now, when it comes to the collections process itself, very often it's very cumbersome. Um, the collections will pile up because there's no streamlined process in place. And the reason why is it, it can be seen as very daunting, a little bit intimidating, a little bit of a hassle. So month after month, you know, you might say this month, oh, I'll handle it next month. The next month, I'll handle it next month. Then all of a sudden you have six months of collections piled up, nothing was addressed, and the firm usually just says, oh, I'm just gonna waive these balances, which is the one thing you don't wanna do. I mean, you can waive for a, a reason, a purpose, uh, maybe an agreement with the client, but it shouldn't be out of just poor processes. You wanna do whatever you can to ensure that 
at least your best effort to put into collection before it gets to that point. Depleted retainers. A lot of law firms forget about this. You don't want to forget about your retainers. Even if you're 100 retainer-based business, retainers do deplete. And an empty retainer actually is just like an unpaid invoice. It's the same type of collection where you're sitting there with an unpaid invoice or work in progress and nothing to pay it with. So you're still having to chase the client for that payment. The difference is this is very, very much preventable, even more so than uh, just your general invoice collections, because you can seek replenishment before it runs out. And we'll talk about how a lot of tools can help with that. And many moving parts. This is probably one of the main reason why law firms struggle to keep things like evergreen retainers, which means the money's always there, or reduce their AR balances. Because there's a lot of things to take track to track on a day-to-day -day basis and um, kind of keep inventory of. And you might have one person that's dedicated to it, or maybe not. Maybe you're in a firm where you're kind of a multitasker and you're having to take care of a lot of different activities. That's the one that most people tend to drop. But it's funny because it affects your bottom line almost the most of everything. So it should be at the, the top of the priority list. So let's talk about what needs to be tracked. Like what are all these different moving parts that uh, law firms struggle with? For invoices, you need to know which invoices are overdue, how long they've been overdue. Is it 30 days, 60 days, 90 days? How much? Is this a $100 invoice we're talking about? Or is this a $10,000 invoice that we're talking about? For retainers, you need to have an idea of how quickly a retainer might be used. For one matter, you might burn through a $10,000 retainer in two months. For another case, it might go a lot slower than that. You might only ask for $2,000 upfront, and that may last a while. So it's understanding the burn rate of those retainers, uh, understanding when you'll likely deplete, and being able to seek out that replenishment beforehand. So like I said, a lot of different moving parts. Uh, and if you don't have the right workflow, it can really be either dropped uh, and nobody does it, and therefore none of this is collected, or very time consuming. So let's talk about some ways that we can automate. I think for collections, probably the hardest part is knowing who owes what since when. You know, it's not the actual action of collections, you know, reaching out to them, though that sometimes can be time consuming. It's more collecting the data and knowing, okay, who do I need to reach out to? Who actually owes us money? Uh, and who owes how much? Maybe the person, one person owes us 20,000 and one person owes us $200. There might be a different priority level on those two cases. If you're tracking manually and think of your firm right now, how you're doing it um, and how efficient it may, may or may not be. But if you only have a handful of clients, then manually, I could see how that could be manageable. But even then, it often gets put off. If you're using any sort of billing tool or thinking of using any sort of billing tool, you should be utilizing that as kind of like your collections agent. All of this data, knowing who owes what since when, that's all in your billing program. If you're doing your invoicing there and your payments there, the system knows what a balance is, when it was due, when the last payment was, what's remaining, all of that information is there. So if you are currently doing manual billing and figuring this out for yourself, just think about how you know billing programs and tools are actually collecting that data for you and can give you an AR report or some sort of reminder mechanism so that you could see who owes what at that given point in time. And this changes, like you may, you know, pull a list yesterday and today it might be different. So you wanna make sure that you're always pulling uh, recent information. So that's the first part, the data collection. And that's usually the hardest part, uh, the one that nobody really wants to get involved in or think it's just too difficult. Once you have that, once you know who is overdue and you need to reach out to them, how do you notify? Um, are you currently, how are you doing it now? Are you calling them? Are you sending a letter? Are you emailing them? This too could be really automated quite a bit. Just like I talked about with sending out invoices, because there's a high volume. Whenever there's something that's high volume, always think about the ways that it can be automated. And for um, billing, like I said, the system's already collecting what's due by who, notifying them. Uh, very often there are tools like 
Dunning letters or invoice reminders where you can send an email or a letter to a person to say, hey, you owe this amount of money. Now this should be a monthly activity. I always tell those that I speak with, different law firms, if you're billing for, uh, let's say right now it's the start of April, we'll skip ahead a little bit. If you're billing for March, you should be doing your reminders for February. So those two activities should be happening all the time, but the reminder por portion should be just as automated as sending out your invoices so that both functions can be done together quickly and in a routine basis. So let's look at some of those options as well. Now, in terms of the data collection, it really comes down to if you're doing a manual process, you have to have pristine records. You have to be able to understand them very well. Um, volume matters a lot. If you have a low volume, manual may work. High volume, that's where it gets a little bit complicated. But if you're using any sort of billing tool, utilize the information in that system to let you know what your AR is or who owes what. For notifications, so let me pull up um, a function called invoice reminders. Like I said, many billing tools uh, across all industries have that concept of uh, what's called dunning uh, or reminders or notifications or past due notices. Uh, that's a fairly common function. So an example of that is here, if I go to email invoice reminders, this is part of that data collection that I mentioned. So I can see here that I have, the number is 86. I have 86 invoices that are overdue by 30 days. I can change this. I can make it 60 or 90 or 15 or whatever I want. But in this example, they're overdue by that much. Now I can select who I wanna notify. So now I know, the first step is knowing I have 86. I need to be aware of that number that may be really high or maybe okay for that time of month. Email, and again, there's a template. There's a letter that's specific for an overdue invoice saying this payment is overdue, please remit payment by this date. The text can be customized, no problem. You could set it up however you'd like, but the key is there's fields. It's that merge method, that mail merge method. So that way I could send this out again, 100 reminders. I'm clicking send, it's going out to 100 people. So you want to make the collection reminder process as simple as possible so that it is done on a routine basis. You're never going to forget to bill a client, but you may put off chasing them for payment. And you don't want to, you want to do that at the same exact time. Now, I don't want to forget about retainers. Uh, like I said, if you're managing retainers and you're currently tracking or trying to track uh, what the value or the amount is for each person and kind of when to ask for replenishment, there's a lot of different things to keep track of. One very helpful thing, and I feel like this would be more so billing tools may not, like a generic billing tool may not have this type of function, but if you're using a legal specific type of billing tool, uh, you should have this type of function, especially if you manage a lot of retainers. So if I'm setting up a particular case, I'm going to actually edit this item and we have a function down here called minimum retainer balance required. So the first step, like I said, is determining what is the minimum for this person. In this particular case, I don't want his retainer to get below $1,000. I wanna seek replenishment at that point uh, because eventually in the, in the near future, I'm gonna be depleted. So that's the first step, I set that up. I go about my normal billing, I go about my normal work, and there's two options in our system as to how you can notify the client. One, which is 100% automated, is you can actually use a, an invoice template, which will include the replenishment amount once they fall below. So if he had, I said the minimum was 1,000, let's say he had $800 in trust. The invoice would tack on another $200 to say that's the new invoice balance. So that's completely automated. Another method, which is more you do on a routine basis, maybe every month, maybe every couple of months, you can come in here and see who is below. I just wanna see who's below that minimum that I set. And this will let me know um, that I have 21 matters that are below on their balance. It will list who the client and matter is, what was required, what I said was required, where they're currently at, and therefore what the replenishment amount is. Now in some areas, I might, like this person's low by $50, I might not bother them just yet, but everybody else is low by a 
few thousand dollars. So I might want to notify them right now. And again, using that email concept, send them a notification, having a standard template so that they can go ahead and uh, receive that notification in a timely manner. The more you follow through with these types of uh, actions, the more your client will respond to them. So again, they can uh, see that they owe funds for a retainer. They hopefully will replenish that fairly soon, and therefore you actually never have a depleted retainer. Okay, let's move to our next area, which is accounting struggles. So when it comes to accounting, um, one of the main struggles that law firms have is while you're trained in law, you know how to work with your clients, rarely are you trained on running a business. Even more so, knowing the specifics of legal accounting and how running a law firm from a business perspective is a little bit different. And because of that, many law firms end up using generic systems for their accounting because that's what every other business do. Uh, usually you're a small business and you figure use tools like QuickBooks or QuickBooks Online or something similar. And what happens is you run into compliance concerns. You start thinking about, am I handling my trust accounting correctly? Are my accounting reports accurate? Also, these tools tend to be very flexible. Am I actually you know, making errors, making mistakes? Am I possibly non-compliant without realizing it because I'm not following like, like legal accounting guidelines per se? So those are two top areas that most law firms struggle with. Now, because of this, um, very often the billing and maybe practice management are separate from the accounting and that leads to a lot of double data entry. So you might be, you know, tracking your costs in two places. You might be tracking your invoice payments in two places. Um, even worse, maybe you're identifying mistakes in your accounting software, which is a routine thing. How do you backtrack and fix those uh, transactions when they're in multiple systems? So that can be quite messy. That can create a web of issues. I hear of this quite often. Even if you're not doing the accounting yourself, even if you have a bookkeeper that's doing it, you're probably hearing these things from your bookkeeper about what lengths they're having to go through to make sure that your books are the way they need to be. And probably the most important is items get dropped or misrecorded. So you might have, uh, like I said, billing items. Billing and accounting are very closely related. So you may have, um, for instance, matter costs. How often have you paid expenses out of pocket and forget to bill them to your client because likely the records are separate. Or maybe your retainers. That's another example where accuracy can be affected. Your retainers are recorded in your for billing purposes and your billing records, but they also need to be tracked in the accounting side of things to be reconciled and doing your reporting there as well. So how do you ensure that these numbers match? How do you ensure that dropped items are even picked up on or even caught? and addressed at that time. And usually they're not. Usually those items fall through, they don't get billed, and therefore you're not gonna get reimbursed for them. Believe it or not, uh, automation can help quite a bit even with accounting concerns. And one of the main uh, ways to go about it is a lot of the struggles that I mentioned in the prior slide are because of two main factors. Using a generic software for legal accounting, but also using multiple tools, you know, having your billing and accounting and your practice management, your trust accounting kind of spread out. So a few things uh, that can really help in terms of automation. Built-in legal accounting. Now, when I'm talking about built-in legal accounting, I mean the logic as well. Um, when you're using a system that has general ledger accounts like uh, trust liability accounts, um, reimbursable client cost accounts, and the system knows when you're doing a trust transaction, it goes to trust liability, nowhere else. That thought process is kind of taken away. So instead of expecting you to have all this knowledge in legal accounting, it's actually doing that for you. Um, same thing with trust safeguards. When you're using a trust specific tool that, you know, like I said, trust is specific to law firms, it has built in logic. Like, I can't overdraft on a ledger, or I need to reconcile every month, or these are the reports that I need. That is built in. So especially with an accounting, I think legal specific tools are uh, really taking a lot of the guesswork out so that everything is recorded correctly. So one example is the cost recovery. That's what I mentioned before. Uh, if you're paying those costs out of pocket, 
and you forget to bill them, that's just money lost out of the firm. But what if you're writing the check and billing the client in the same step, in the same window? The risk effectively then goes away. Fee distribution. Think about whether you're doing this in your firm right now or if it's something that you want to do in the future. This is tracking collections by party. Maybe how much income an originating attorney brought in or how much income a specific timekeeper might have collected. That may also be rewarded in the firm. You know, every uh, originator gets 10% of what comes in. Every timekeeper gets 60% of what they worked on. That all comes down to how your distribution model is set up. But even just tracking that information and having that knowledge of who brings in what is very important for business decisions. You also can um, apply this not just to parties, but to classes. Maybe you want to see which practice area is most profitable, um, which department is spending money where, maybe from a marketing perspective, where are all these expenses going. Um, if you have multiple locations, you want to be able to track your costs um, per location as well. So when it comes to tracking, distributing, and reporting, you first need to identify what your needs are from a business perspective, like for your firm, and then figure out how, if at all, can be done in your current setup. But fee distribution is very similar to like almost like a commission structure, which not all tools can fulfill. So you want to make sure that um, in distribution, fee distribution, you're tracking just the fee, not reimbursed expenses, and that um, you're able to report on that as well. So with the billing and accounting workflow together, that gets simplified uh, quite a bit. Invoice allocations, um, when your invoice is paid, that's both a billing and accounting activity, which of course involves multiple entries. How do you ensure that you know the general ledger is updated, the invoice is updated, the balances are done? That too is a benefit of built-in billing and accounting, that workflow get a lot more streamlined and a lot more automated. And then you have um, a few well-known uh, automations, which are more so around transaction or reconciliations. For importing of transactions, you have functions like bank feeds, which is you know bank information feeding directly into the system, or Excel imports, if you have Excel copies of uh, maybe from your bank's website or somewhere else, you can import that information also. That helps a lot. Very good for credit card transactions. If you have a business credit card, you don't want to rely on memory, receipts, and going through one by one. You want to be able to ensure everything's been captured. Imports and bank feeds are very helpful for that because those credit cards often are not just firm expenses, they're also client expenses as well. Auto reconciliation, um, again, bank fee can be used, bank statement imports, that really allows the software to find matches for you, especially if you're a highly transactional firm and you have a lot of different transactions to go through. I know especially real estate firms or even personal injury, there's a lot of money going in and out and you need to be able to reconcile that efficiently. So software can take your bank statement, your record, compare and find matches. You're still going to have to review it. That's, of course, a requirement. You don't want to get rid of that, but it will make that process a lot less time consuming for you. So a couple examples from an accounting perspective. Pretty simple to show, but uh, I know a lot of times this concept is not well known, so I like to give a little bit of a visual. I talked about costs. So this is a big automation. Um, like I said, a lot of these functions affect both the billing and accounting. So why not get them done in one place? So that increases accuracy, but also saves your time. So if I have a filing fee that I'm paying for this client, let's say $150, and I'm gonna pay that to the courthouse today. This is the transaction. I even have a client cost account selected. This is the expense card. So I know that this is gonna get billed to this client. It's not going to fall through. I'm not having to go through two different places. So again, several things are happening at once and they're all legal specific. So I can cut that check, which by the way, up here I'm printing. I can cut that check. I can make an entry on my general ledger that is legal specific. And I can have this uh, added as an expense card for the next invoice. So very much streamlined, very much automated. For um, things like bank feed, just to give a quick example of that, if I go within a particular bank, 
let's say, whoop, right up here. I happen to have a credit card bank that is linked through bank feed. And all that does is it creates a separate area where these transactions feed in from the bank. In this case, it's my credit card bank. I could see the item. I could link it to, I don't know what I'm selecting here. Let me go, uh, let's say advertising. I could say that this is an advertising expense. So that'll mark it to my general ledger. Very good. But let's say this is a client expense, actually. I need to get reimbursed for it. I'm going to edit that item, post as matter expense, and then I can go ahead and actually post that for billing as well. So you want that workflow to be very much streamlined because that's how you ensure that you get reimbursed for these expenses that you're paying out of pocket. All right, and then we're gonna move to our next item. We're gonna wrap up in the next couple minutes. Uh, events and tasks. So especially when you're dealing with tasks, um, you probably have missed items in the past, even worse deadlines, that's an even bigger problem. So. The accurate tracking is really what's essential to make sure that everything's completed on time. You need to be able to know what is due when, because often, depending on your practice area, if you miss a deadline, you're in big, big trouble. It could actually be a severe consequence to the firm. So you need to make sure these items are very closely uh, watched. Also, don't forget your own billing purposes. Are you billing for the time that you're spending on these different activities? Whether it's an event or a task or something that you're drafting, do you eventually have to bill for that? How do you make sure that that gets billed for and that it doesn't get dropped? Often, you could have 30 tasks. Are they all billed for? Likely not. And not intentionally not billed for. It's not that you're waiving it, you just forget or they fall through. Second is inconsistency from case to case. If you have a similar, or especially if you have a certain practice area, we have cases that are very similar to each other, could be similar tasks, timelines, appointments, um, you know, filing deadlines is very common for that as well. You don't wanna reinvent the wheel every time. You wanna make it consistent. You wanna be able to um, have that information available, have those tasks or events accessible to populate for you. Because what often happens is you're kind of redrafting, let's say 10, 10 items have to be done. Um, a prime example is with a new client. Every time a new client comes in, these 10 administrative things have to be done so that the file gets set up. What if each time different things are getting done? Not everything is consistent. The order is not the same. Things get dropped or forgotten. That is something, if you can have consistency, you wanna promote it. And that of course leads to repetitive data entry. With automation, as you might have seen a theme kind of as we're going, you don't want to do anything multiple steps that you can do in just one. And events and tasks often fall into that. You need things like recurring events, deadline schedules, workflows, things that are constantly repeated. You're, you or your staff should not be entering that time and time and time again. You want to have an efficient way to ensure everything that gets captured. So how can you automate? Uh, a few suggestions on that. Mobile team calendaring. Uh, mobility is really the key with daily activities. You wanna be able to see when um, things need to get done, but also your events. I know many law firms still print out their calendar the morning of, by 10 a.m. it's out of date. It's no longer accurate. So if you're able to pull up your to-do list or your calendar on your phone, let's say, or your tablet or your laptop, but that's the same task list and same calendar that your secretary has access to, or the paralegal, or the other attorneys that you're working with. You know any changes will be reflected there and everything is kind of syncing and working together. Task workflows. Uh, this is for those repetitive items that you can easily drop. If you can create uh, templates, every time a new client walks in, these 10 things have to get done. Create a workflow for that. Have it in, um, well, a lot of practice management software have these types of functions. Have that saved in an area where they could just populate it when that person walks in the door. You don't want that person responsible for remembering everything that has to get done. There should be essentially a checklist of things that have to be completed and that same list is used every single time. Billable flags. Um, communication between your daily activities and the different tools you may be using with your billing is definitely essential. You want to use tools that are part of your billing workflow or at least communicate with your billing workflow so that they can notify or alert you 
if these billable items are not um, actually billed. Maybe an entry never gets made for them. You need to have some sort of reminder function to ensure that that actually gets billed for. And then integrations or syncs. Um, more so just a matter of convenience, but also could be very useful for your matter management. For instance, if you're using Google Calendar right now, and let's say it syncs with your practice management tool, you can then continue to use Google, which you're very comfortable with and like to use and maybe like to access on your phone and all of that. But also through that sync, your events are now filed along all your other matter information and can maybe get flagged for billing as well. So that integration, especially from a calendaring perspective, allows you to stick with the tools that you're comfortable with, but ensures that that important information is still on a matter management level. And our last point that we'll be talking about is documentation struggles. Um, in terms of standardization, are you writing the same thank you letter every time? Uh, are you spending a lot of time customizing individual documents, letters, agreements? Um, whenever you can standardize, you definitely want to take that route if at all possible. Do you have a basic foundation to start with? which can save you a lot of time. I understand that not every document is a cookie cutter and is the same across the board, but a solid foundation that does at least half the job for you um, is, is always helpful with that. Otherwise, you're gonna end up you know, kind of writing the same thing over and over again, spending lots of time on it, uh, and then you know, not really having consistency across all of your documents. They don't have to be identical, but certain messaging and communication, especially when you're dealing with things like um, client, just you know, general client communications or retainer agreements, sometimes you wanna have a bit of consistency there. So that way uh, the expectations are kind of the same across the board. And lastly, talking about storage and delivery. Um, once you have your documents, they're drafted, they're, they're good to go, how are they being stored or shared with your client? Do you have multiple copies in different places? Are they easily accessible from everybody that's maybe needing to access those documents themselves? Are your clients receiving them promptly and securely? These are all things to think about. Um, I mean, documents are important in any law firm, but the security of those and making sure they're confidential and that your client always has access to them is very important. So some automation tips. First tip, maintain a template library. Templates are really great for the type of documents you do all the time, like letters, forms, agreements. That does not mean that every template works for every firm. So I don't want you thinking that you can go to, you know, some template website, download a form like every other firm has downloaded and use that, and it's great. You want to start with that. Start with this general template. Make it your own and then maintain your own updated template library, and that will apply to your specific practice. There's only a certain amount of documents that you use from time to time, but have a template library. That could be easily accessed by anybody in the firm if they need to draft a specific, specific type of document. Uh, that, I think, with the templates combined with the next point, which is merge functions. I showed a bunch of that with the emailing before. If you can utilize uh, tools called document merging, um, assembly, those functions are very often in um, practice management softwares or sometimes on their own as well. It takes your template and merges it with data in the system. That way you can uh, swap out things like uh, name, address, balances, any client-specific information can be swapped in and out for each person. So you're essentially using the same um, mold, but making it work for each client in a very automated fashion. And then I talked about client portals before, um, being able to share documentation. One reason uh, for client portals, not just that it's convenient, but it's secure. So you wanna make sure that any way you're exchanging specifically documents with your clients, is secure. If you're using email, that is not secure. You need to encrypt that yourself. Client portals have their own built-in encryption. If you're using a document storage application, that allows you to share with your client, ensure that those are encrypted as well. Uh, that's the main thing. Uh, you want to make sure it's easily accessible and always secure for your client. Okay, so that wraps up our uh, topic for today. Uh, for those who 
like I said, may not be familiar with Cosmolex. Uh, we touched upon some of these areas, overall uh, billing, accounting, practice management on the cloud. So if you wanna learn a little bit more about that, feel free to reach out to us. All right, we wanna thank everyone uh, for attending today's Cosmolex webinar series presentation. We hope that it was educational for you and your law practice.